to say he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave welcome to our online service and our theme today is what does it mean to walk in the light? And Kelvin will be sharing with us based on readings by Rosie Shelton and Claire Duncalf. The Harris family will be leading our prayers and we have a special message from Paul Harcourt from New Wine on how to cope with lockdown too. But now an opening prayer. O God of peace, whose Son Jesus Christ proclaimed the kingdom and restored the broken to wholeness of life. Look with compassion upon the anguish of the world and by your healing power make whole both people and nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. of the world who steps down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made his heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here I am to Peace in 
my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In my questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace. In my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you, oh My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore tomorrow brings with each morning I'll rise and sing my God's love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the dark Chapter 19, verses 11 to 26, the parable of the ten minas. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. 
His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit, so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him, and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. This is the word of the Lord. Hi guys, I'm Jordan. I'm one of the first year students here at Moorlands. Um, you probably already know Lydia and Eleanor. Uh, today I'm going to go through the reading with you um, using Minecraft and we're going to have a little bit of a think about gifts and talents. So, what can we learn from this parable? Jesus told it because his followers believed that the kingdom of God would appear instantly. In the parable, Jesus is the noble man who is made king, just like what happened when he went to sit next to God in heaven. But in the same way, he's coming back, just like the man in the parable did. Also like in the parable, while he's gone, he has left us with many gifts and talents, the exact same way the man did with his three servants. So, there are three groups of people in the parable that Jesus tells. The first are those who hate the king and say, we do not want him to reign over us. The next are the first and second servants. Both of them used what they were given to create more and were prepared for the return of their master. He was really pleased with what they had done, and so he rewarded them, just like Jesus will reward us if we use what he's given us here on earth. The final is the last servant. He had just as much gifting as the others, but he did nothing with it. He wasn't prepared at all for the return of the king. Instead, he hid his gift. So, what are some ways that we hide and don't use our gifts and talents today? Maybe we might feel too shy to use them. Maybe we're worried about what people might think of us when we use those gifts. Maybe we don't even realise what gifts we have because we've never been given the opportunity to use them. Let's pause for a second and think. What are some of the talents that you have? You might think that you don't have any, but in Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says that God has made us to do good works, and that means all of us. God loves us so much that he has given each and every one of us gifts, and all can be used in his kingdom. Some gifts might be more obvious than others, like singing or football, but just because you might not have an obvious gift does not mean that you don't have any at all. That's why it's so important to try new things, so you can explore other areas where you might discover a whole new skill that you never knew you had. Or maybe we don't use our talents because we don't think they're very good. We can't always see the value of what we've been given, just like the third servant. Do you ever look at your friends and think that they are more talented than you are? Have you ever been jealous of what your friends can do? When you compare yourself to other people, you end up overlooking what you already have. God has given you a particular set of skills for a reason, and you are so unique that no one else can do what you can do in the same way. As we can see from the parable, it's really important that we're prepared to use the gifts that God has given us, so that when he returns, he can turn to us and say that we were good servants. So again, what are some of the gifts that God has given you? Spend some time today and throughout this week thinking about the gifts that God's given you, and if you don't know what your gifts are yet, well, God would love to tell you. And all you need to do is ask him. I see you crazy dance. Woohoo! Good dance, this. Brilliant. Everybody sing ah 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 ah. We praise you, yeah. Lord Jesus. Ah 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 ah. We praise you, Lord. Oh. Much, much more than anything we ask. Oh.
reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. The day of the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer, suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Thanks be to God. One of the benefits of being a vicar in the Church of England is that they give you a big house to live in. In the 1980s, we lived in a lovely six-bedroom directory. Unfortunately, the Church of England at that time didn't provide burglar alarms or even window locks. We were burgled six times before they put in window locks and four more times before they fitted a burglar alarm. Many of you who have been burgled know that it is a shocking experience. You feel as if you have been personally violated. The worst instance was when we had Jan's father staying with us and during the night a burglar stole money from his bedside table. The thing that made us most upset and furious was that the burglar had had to come past our children's bedrooms to reach that money. Four nights afterwards we stood with a baseball bat on the stairs waiting. The idea of some stranger handling your things, going through your cupboards, knowing where your children sleep and what kind of toys they take to bed with them, violates one of our most precious illusions, that our homes are our safe places, our private places where we can protect ourselves from the world and all its threats. So I find it hard to think of Jesus, my friend, my brother, my saviour, as a burglar. But that's what Paul is talking about in our Bible reading. John in Revelation 16 has Jesus saying, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. He's saying, can you imagine a burglar ringing you up first to see when might be a good time for him to break into your house? Would Monday be all right? or? Would Wednesday be better for you? No, he's going to come when you're not ready, when you don't expect him. So what is he after? Obviously, he's not interested in your jewellery or your TV. He's interested in you. Although apparently not in the daytime you, the one most people see while you're out doing whatever it is you do in the world. 
that's you with your best face on. A you that's been washed and brushed up for a public appearance, but at night, well, that's a different story. Now is when Jesus the burglar is most interested in you. When you think no one is watching, when you think you're safe, when you think you're alone. Why would a compassionate, caring Lord Jesus do a thing like that? You know why. Because you are so well protected the rest of the time. Because it's the only time your guard is down. After years of steady practice, you've learned how to keep almost everyone and everything at a safe distance. But a good thief knows when your defences are lowered. He comes when you least expect him. Like any other thief, this one is after your valuables. But unlike any other, this one knows what's really valuable. Not your silver and your laptop, but your heart, your soul, your mind. They are precious to him. Because this thief comes not to take, but to give. And if we could just let him do what he so wants to do, we would find him not filling his pockets, but emptying them and pouring real riches into our lives. At the beginning of this talk, I told you how many burglaries we've had. But the important word there is had. Since we've had a burglar alarm, we've had no more burglaries. And neither do we as believers. We do not need to fear swift and sudden judgment. The thief in the night will not catch us by surprise. Christians are in a separate category. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Paul says in verse 4, it is only those in darkness who will be taken unawares, and we are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. Verse 5, praise the Lord that God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. So, what are we to do? Firstly, be aware of the times. We who know Christ are not in the dark about what's going on. We are not ignorant. We know that the day of the Lord is near. The signs of the times are very clear to the believer. Knowing that time is limited has long been a spur for Christians to share our good news about Jesus with others. As St Peter says, be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Secondly, prepare for the journey. Get your affairs in order. Arrange your life, ready for the triumphant return of Jesus. Be alert and watch for his coming. Verse 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Now is not the time to get complacent. Verse 8. Since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Faith and love, like an armoured breastplate, protect the heart from fear and hate. Hope, like a helmet, protects the mind from despair and despondency. Oh yes, these are perilous times. 
and not just because of the coronavirus, but with faith in God, we can move forward with confidence. With his love for others, we can drive out hate. And with hope in the promises of God, we can persevere through any problem or trouble we might face. As a believer, whether you know what's going on or not, Jesus is coming for you. So wake up, sober up and dress up because you are going on a wonderful journey. Finally, and this is really important, care for each other. Verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as you are doing. And that's what followers of Christ do. We help each other. We help each other when one of us falls. We help each other to climb the spiritual heights. Week by week, our prayer chain provides prayer support speedily for those in need. Week by week, members of our fellowship are phoning others who are finding the loneliness and separation of lockdown difficult. Week by week, through our home groups and through our children and young people's work, we are learning more and more about our wonderful God. So be aware of the times, prepare for the journey, and care for each other. Let me leave you with an old preacher's story. There were three apprentice devils who were taking their final exam in front of Satan. Before I let you loose in the world, Satan said, I need to know what deceitful message you're going to whisper in the ears of people so that they end up here in hell. That's easy, said the first devil. I'll tell them there is no heaven. That's a good idea, said Satan, but it won't work. Whenever people look at the beauty of the earth and feel the wonders of creation, they know that heaven exists. The second devil said, I'll tell them, but there's no hell. You've been listening to too much John Lennon, said Satan. That won't work either, for in every human heart, there's a thing called conscience an inner voice which testifies to the truth that not only will good be triumphant, but that evil will be defeated. The third devil thought for a moment and then said, I'll tell them that there's no hurry. Excellent, Satan declared. So this next song is one that I very recently finished writing and it was inspired by a word that God gave to me very clearly and audibly during a quiet time with him a couple of years ago where he said to me that I was to be a light in the darkness. Of course we're all called to be light in the darkness which is what this song encourages. Jesus says in Matthew 5 14, 16 You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This song is called Be the Light.
It's entrance only More room inside But then there's something There's still small something In the dark speed of light In the dark let it shine The valley's deep The chasm wide With all the emptiness I feel inside But then there's something It's still small something you had something in the darkness be the light the flaming beacon in the night don't try and hide it get up on your stand let your light shine out across the land in the darkness in the night be the light in the darkness in the night be the light like a lighthouse here shining out across the stormy sea let your light shine Like a firework lighting up the sky for all to see, let your light shine in the darkness. Be the light in the darkness. Let it shine. In the darkness, be the light A flaming beacon in the night Don't try and hide it, get a party stand Let your light shine out across the whole land In the darkness, in the night, be the light In the darkness in the night be the light in the darkness in the night be the light in the darkness in the night be the light in the darkness in the night be the light in the darkness in the I wanted to share some thoughts with you from Acts chapter 27, which has been much on my heart recently. I know a lot of people have struggled through the last six months, and the thought that this might be stretching out for six or nine months more has really hit people hard. Acts chapter 27 tells the story of the Apostle Paul and Luke, his traveling companion, going to Rome in a ship and the storms that they go through and the shipwreck that they suffer. And I just wanted to pick a few things out because I think it speaks to us about going through a really difficult time like this. As we are reading through this passage, um, Luke 
is very personal and records his own personal testimony, not just talking about what happened to Paul, but he was very much there himself. And he uses words like this, the winds were against us, we made slow progress, sailing had become dangerous. And it says that the Apostle Paul knew that problems were ahead, and so he spoke to those in charge, the centurion and the owner of the ship, but the centurion didn't take his advice. And so wrong decisions were being made and peril lay ahead. As they carried on, it says, we thought we'd obtained what we wanted. Maybe there was a bit of a full storm in a change in the weather. And you might be feeling like that now. People who are thinking, well, we can get through this and then in the autumn it will start to relax. Well, sometimes a full storm really throws you back onto yourself and you end up feeling particularly discouraged. What happens here is they go into an even stronger experience of storm. We were caught by the storm, we were driven along, we took a violent battering, and then all the way down to verse 20 it says, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And I wanted to look briefly at what the Apostle Paul says, because at that point he speaks to the men on the ship, and the first thing he says is, keep up your courage. I want to say that to you today, keep up your courage, and let's encourage each other. These are difficult days, but keep courage up. God is still in charge. And that's the second thing, because Paul says, I have been told by God that not a single life will be lost, but the ship will be destroyed. And there's a couple of things there. The first thing is God's plan and purpose is still going ahead. An angel appears to Paul and says, you are going to carry the gospel to Caesar. You are going to go before kings and princes and fulfill the prophecy that's been over your life since Acts chapter 9. But the ship is going to be destroyed. There's going to be rough seas ahead on this journey. And very practically, the Apostle Paul in the rest of the chapter gives four things that we might do to position ourselves to continue to believe that God is going to work his purpose out, but to deal with the hardships that lie ahead. The first is that he refuses to escape. He refuses to quit. What they actually do is they cut adrift the life rafts so that none of the sailors can get overboard and just try something else. Stick with the plan. Follow the call of God on your life. Believe that he still has a plan and a purpose for you and don't look at escape. The second is that we need to eat to survive. It says in verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, we might think in our context, for the last six months. Paul says, for the last 14 days, you have been in constant suspense and you've gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Let's just take that in an obvious spiritual way. As we go through these days, you've got to feed yourself to survive. Feed yourself on the word of God. Feed yourself in worship, in prayer. Feed yourself in fellowship as you're able to do. Not just encourage each other, but encourage yourself in the Lord. Feed yourself if you're going to survive. Look to your own personal spiritual rhythms and make sure that you're spending time with God. The third thing is, well, it says that after they'd eaten, they were all encouraged, and after they'd eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. And I want to say that to you as well. During this time, lighten the load. There may be that there are things that you're carrying which can just be thrown over because they're not life-giving in this season. Maybe you can cut out some stuff in your life. Maybe there's stuff that's been on you as an expectation or expectations that you've put onto yourself and they're just not appropriate for the moment that we're in. So lighten the load and throw away what you don't need. It may well be that actually coming out of this time that's one of the most helpful things you can do. You can embrace a new pattern because you've thrown away the things that are no longer life-giving. Perhaps they belong to the past and not to the future. And then finally, about that future, it says in verse 39, when daylight came, and be encouraged because daylight will come, there is something on the other side of this storm. After all of the pandemic restrictions, there will be a time when it's in the past and we're able to go into the future. 
But, but look what it says here. When daylight, when daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach. And I think that's going to be the same for us. On the other side of the storm that we're in, we may not recognize the land. You may not recognize what your ministry looks like. You may not recognize what the church looks like. We may not recognize what society looks like. But there'll still be something that we'll see and we'll recognize that that's the way to go forward. They didn't recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach. And that was the thing that God wanted them to do next. And so those, those four things, don't think about escaping, don't jump ship, stick with the plan because God is working his purposes out, even in the middle of this storm. Eat to survive, lighten the load and be prepared that we're going to be in strange lands, but there will still be a next step for us to take. That really spoke to me, Acts 27, I hope it speaks to you as well. Thank you for all you're doing. Keep connected, be part of your network, join with others and look online for all the resources that we're producing in New Wine. I'm praying for you and I pray that God will really bless you as you bless and serve others. Let us pray. Thank, Thank you, Jesus, Jesus that, that you are with, with us all, all of the time. time. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that even when you are, we are afraid, you are with us. Even when it's dark, you are with us. Even when we feel alone, you are with us. Thank, Thank you, Jesus, Jesus, that, that you, you are, are with us with all, us all of the time. the time. Thank you, Lord, that even when we don't see your, you or feel you, you are still there guiding us, helping us and protecting us. Thank, Thank you, Jesus, Jesus that, that you are with us all, all of the time. time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be powerful. And you are my best friend. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us all of the time. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what happens, you'll never leave us. You'll always be watching over us and helping us. Thank, Thank you, Jesus, Jesus that, that you are with, with us all, all of the time. time. Lord, help us, the, help the doctors and nurses and all the people who help to make us better. Protect them and help them to carry on helping stick sick people even when in hard times like this. Even when things seem dark and difficult, let them see the light. Thank you, Thank you Jesus, Jesus, that, that you, you are with us all of the time. time. Lord, be with those who are sick or grieving. Let them feel your comfort and support. We know that the times we are living in are incredibly difficult for many. For those who can only see darkness, let them see light and help us to bring your light to those in darkness. Thank, Thank you, Jesus, that, that you are with us all, all of the time. time. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, please help us to be like you, to be kind to us, and show to your love to them. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us all of the time. Lord, we pray for our world, for the countries badly affected by coronavirus. Please can we see your spirit move bringing healing to those in need and wisdom and discernment for those researching a vaccine. Help our own leaders, both government and church, to make the right decisions and may they hear the still small voice of your spirit. We pray particularly for America as it prepares for a new leader 
and that the divisions they've experienced will be healed. We pray for those countries in desperate poverty across Africa, South America, Asia and Eastern Europe. Give strength to the weak and power to those agencies trying to be, bring relief at such a difficult time. Lord, we lift our troubled world to you and ask you to come, Lord Jesus. We place our hope in you. Thank, Thank you, you Jesus, Jesus, that you are with us all of the time. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So thank you to everyone who's taken part in our service today. And you'll be aware that our churches are open for private prayer by arrangement with me, but not for public worship. So why not look up some services you've missed on our YouTube channel? That's YouTube St Saviour's Bournemouth. And that'll include morning praise, traditional Holy Communion, messy church, worship songs, as well as materials prepared by our youth and children's ministers. But now, a final prayer and blessing. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon each one of you and those whom you love, now and for evermore. Amen. Now before we have our final song, as a response to our church leaders' call to prayer during lockdown two, first of all, please join in daily prayer at home at 6pm or whenever's most convenient to you. And you can use the Thy Kingdom Come app to focus your prayers, details of which are in our weekly update and newsletter. But also, every day, between 1.30 and 2.30 p.m., St Saviour's will be open for private prayer. And that's from Monday the 16th of November. Again, details in our weekly update and newsletter. But that means every day, Monday through to Sunday. Because we know that when we pray, God acts.
Thank you.